written originally in 1938, reimagined and set in the 80s by a fantastic filmmaker with really amazing mood music. Let's see if you can guess. And there's something so tense about that low, slightly uh, synthesized sort of beat, right? There's something sinister in it, but also very calm and predatory, something weighty. I'm referring to, if you, <laughs> I would think that you probably already know, the movie The Thing and the original story that it's based on, John W. Campbell Jr.'s Who Goes There. Now, I would think that a very large number of people who would ever see this video know and have seen the original 80s The Thing, but we're just going to say this right away. If you haven't seen that movie for some reason, then you should absolutely stop watching this video. Go watch that movie. You don't have to do it right away. I mean, do on your in your own time, right? But there's, I don't want to ruin that experience. There's nothing that I could possibly say here that would uh, enhance that experience, and I could only maybe detract from it to some extent. That movie is best experienced first. I, you could go and read the Campbell story first, but I really think even though the Campbell story is very good, and I'm going to talk about that and about its different iterations, I really feel that you would be best served by experiencing the John Carpenter movie. It's just so good. It is, I think, maybe the best horror movie, and I think that it could even stand up pretty strong to great movies. But it still does things so well that it somewhat transcends what it's supposed to be. It's a classic thriller. It's up there with anything that Hitchcock has done, I think. Go watch that movie. Uh, you can come back here if you like. I, it's a little presumptuous of me to expect you to leave and go see a whole movie and come back here and say, oh, let's see what he had to say. But if you do, I thank you. I think if you have seen the movie that the story will not be spoiled for you. Now, you might find the story, as you could probably expect, written in 1938 to, and written for a pulp magazine, Astounding, I believe, Astounding Stories, I think, uh, to be a little dated. Well, yes, it is. It is. I think it still is worth your time, but absolutely dated. I mean, I read older science fiction a lot, and I found that, yeah, it was there were different parts of that story that I felt were sort of difficult to parse. It was just sort of like, what? How did... It's just phrased strangely. I don't know if that's... Part of that, I think, is the writing style of the time you know, hasn't, uh, it's just, is this a little different? And also I think that there's a sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a sort of expectations of works from that time to, uh, I don't know, maybe pace the story a certain way. And so as a result, that story has a lot of uh, logic leaps. And I'll probably use some examples later, but that's just something to know. But I do recommend you read it. I mean, I guess I should say this to the end, but yeah, you should read that story. Um, but there are a couple versions of that, and then there's even another version that uh, I'm going to recommend as well, although it's kind of a difficult thing to recommend for uh, price reasons. So first we should acknowledge that the story from the movie The Thing, the script, the screenplay, is not a direct translation of the short story. That screenplay by Bill Lancaster is not the same. It definitely makes changes, I think a lot of them for the better of the story, to pace things out, right? Okay, slight spoiler. I mean, well, okay, wait, we already said there's no mean to spoil. There's spoiler, 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 so it's too late. It's, it's, again, anything from here on out, anything from a couple seconds ago, spoiler, sure. So when the um, Norwegian or Swedish, I can't remember which one they are, they get confused in the movie and it made me confused trying to think about it. The helicopter shows up and they're trying to kill this uh, sled dog. That opening, and then the discovery that the American uh, science team makes when they go and explore that camp in ruins is a far better setup than who goes there. But who goes there actually still has a really 
good setup because who goes there actually is much more similar to what we would have expected to have seen at the Swedish camp, or this is uh, Norwegian or Swedish, I can't remember which, whichever one it was, the, their camp. That's where it is. This is not, the story does not start off with them discovering another scientific group's failure to deal with the thing. Instead, it's their own sort of like hubris at sort of digging this thing up from the ice and uh, deciding that it's okay to thaw it out. And that's how the scene opens and who goes there. It opens up with the scientists of this uh, Antarctic expedition looking at this creature that they've cut out of a block of ice. They discovered it by um, this sort of uh, reading for a second southern pole in their uh, magnetic readings. And so they say, well, this seems weird. We'll just go out and look at it. And they go out and they find this massive object in the ice, uh, buried in the ice. And then they find a separate uh, alien creature in the ice and they cut the creature out and they say, well, we're just trying to see if we can get the ship out of here. And they so lay down some explosives and try and blow it up. Well, the alien ship is made of magnesium. And I just want to break in and just say that magnesium is extremely flammable. And of course the story realizes that. So I'm not really certain. I mean, the story totally gets that. I just don't understand really why this superior, I guess, alien technology would be made of magnesium. Magnesium burns and it burns extremely hot. So it's like a terrible choice for something that's going to experience a lot of uh, heat. Uh, maybe there's uh, some other reasoning there. I mean, this story was written in 38, so we shouldn't uh, be too harsh. I'm totally not faulting it. It just, it's a, to my thing, I'm like, whoa, how would you make your ship out of magnesium? That seems like a terrible choice. <laughs> that's one of the things that's fun about older science fiction, right? There's a sort of like, oh no, that wouldn't work very well. <laughs> But, but that's that's part of its endearing quality, part of what was lovely about it. So they they essentially like destroy this alien ship and like and any chance they have of discovering this alien technology or whatever it was in there. And but they come back in a with a block of ice with this creature in it that is horrible looking, is terrifying. In fact, you know, a couple of the scientists say um, oh, this thing is a creature from nightmares. There, there's no way that thing could ever be peaceable or good or kind or anything. It's a creature of evil and malice, which is such a inter And then, of course, the, you know, Campbell does a good job where he has other scientists say, well, that's kind of a stupid point of view. I mean, we don't really know anything about this alien and we might look like horrible, evil creatures to it. So I think there's some good back and forth there. But this is another, this is sort of an example of like, how these sort of really big logic leaps happen, um, where uh, a character definitively says, nope, that thing's evil, like that, like almost that quickly. And then somebody's like, oh, well, I don't know. And then they try and argue against it. And somebody's like, nope, it's evil, man. I'm not going to be argued against it. You're not going to convince me otherwise. You know, there's a lot of these logical leaps. Uh, and they could be, that's like not the worst one, but there's a number of them. Those probably gave me the most pause, more than the slightly archaic sort of writing um, style. It's not that it's hard to read this story, but just the phrasing of certain sentences in Who Goes There is a little archaic. And there was a few times where I'm sort of like not entirely clear. Like I could, I, I, I know all these words, but I'm just not really sure if I know what they mean in this order. You know, that was, and then it sort of puzzled, I'm like, oh, I see, you know, and a lot of the story, a lot of times that's given in, um, like dialogue, these characters die, you know, dialogue back and forth. And it's just a strange archaic phrasing of something or a way of saying something that I sort of like, maybe I could puzzle out and I understood, but just, just really slowed me down. It was like a speed bump to my reading. Um, so just, that's. I don't know, again, a characteristic of older fiction. I mean, you kind of have to uh, be able to endure that. If that's something you just couldn't tolerate, then I'm not really sure what you're doing reading older science fiction. But I think that it's a, uh, it's definitely something to be able to tolerate that is definitely a skill that we want to build. And I think it's uh, useful. And also, uh, I guess just while I'm saying, while I'm thinking of it, one of the things I think is just kind of hilarious or just so humorous is uh, the way that these scientists are described. Um, John W. Campbell Jr. himself was tall and athletic and all the scientists in this crew are like, I don't know, like Greek gods <laughs> in their description. I mean, McReady, the character played by Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas? No, 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 no. <laughs> Kirk Douglas. Played by Kurt Russell in the movie. Um, like, he's described as being like bronze-skinned and muscular and tall, and all the scientists are. And then if the scientists aren't tall, then they're short, stocky, and extremely muscular. 
And it's such an interesting point of view to look at these scientists. These, you know, we have this view of like the spectacled, you know, sort of like a uh, very thin and sort of like a uh, sickly view of scientists that we've got, but not in the, who goes there? Not at all. All these guys are like men of the elements. They're men of nature and <laughs> exploration. I guess it kind of makes sense because they're in an Antarctic expedition where they're there for a long time. And so you, they need to be like, um, used to the outdoors, but just like the number of times that someone is described as being so physically apt is just, uh, goes to the level to me of being a little humorous. <laughs> just sort of like, I just don't, it's like this community of like 30 something scientists here in, in Antarctica and they're all just like built, just all stacked, you know, and tanned and strong and <laughs> definitive. It's just very interesting. It's just a, just a, a very, a very unexpected sort of a, like presentation of scientists in the story. <laughs> Anyways, but that's sort of like the problem or the kind of one of the things, these logical leaps. One of the reasons that happens that I think has only come to light in more recent years is that who goes there is actually a second draft. The original version of the story was a novella length, not a short story, but novella length work that Campbell wrote. He was an editor for, I don't know if it was Astounding Stories itself or uh, like a uh, like a sister magazine, but um, he was an editor. And so he actually published Who Goes There under a pseudonym, Don Stewart. Now, I think because he was an editor uh, to in some extent with the same company that he kind of had to like present this to his bosses or his uh, his co-workers, so to speak, uh, you know, to sort of get approval to publish your own stuff. And they said, well, this this version of the story is too long. You're going to need to cut it down. It needs to be trimmed down. So he said, OK, he went back and trimmed it. And so he had done a lot of work on the story um, in a lot of research that he wanted to maintain that he felt was essential to the story. And I think it does help the story quite a bit. And instead, that all that information is put, it was in a much larger story, it's put into a much smaller story. In recent years, it came to light, they had a, another draft. That draft was discovered and published. The original novella was published as Frozen Hell, uh, which is mostly additional material at the beginning of the story. I don't think there's, I think the farther into the story you get, the less difference there is. Who goes there starts with... Um, all the scientists are gathering around and they're having this debate about whether or not they should thaw this thing out and experiment on it. And, you know, some people say it's fine. You know, we, we're going to go ahead and do this. There's no risk. And somebody says, well, what about microorganisms? And they say, oh, well, you can't catch a, kid, a cold from a dog or whatever. So why would you think you can get something from this creature that's not even on this planet? And then there's some back and forth. And ultimately it's like, eh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. You know, go ahead and do it. It seems totally like nothing bad could happen. From this and and i kind of thought like well why would you even do it here but um you know and that's that was interesting because it's sort of one of those uh things where you encounter sort of the limitations of the technology at the time that doesn't occur to you but then you know they do kind of say like well we can't take it back to the states or some somewhere else it'll melt it'll just rot by the time we get out you know it's there's no way for us to keep it cold and i didn't think about like the difficulties of keeping something like that refrigerated or frozen yeah, you know, and also the slowness of transportation. I'm like, okay, that kind of makes sense. You know, yeah, it wouldn't really work. You wouldn't be able to do that. It would melt before it got there, before you could have some science team look at it. So I thought that was kind of a, you know, or initially I thought like, this doesn't make much sense. And then in hindsight, I don't remember if that was in the original story who goes there or if that was Frozen Hell that addressed that. Um, because there are slight differences. A lot of the um, exposition that is very abrupt and sharp in who goes there is fleshed out and given room to breathe in frozen hell it is to its detriment frozen hell's detriment that it doesn't have that really iconic or really uh sort of interesting beginning where these these scientists these men of bronze are debating back and forth kind of a little angry with each other whether or not they should let experiment on this thing, take test it and see what's going on with it because you know this is the only opportunity we have. That scene is really good and we and it's a little muted in Frozen Hell. It isn't quite as strong here, but you get a lot more time for the events that are sort of like like intermittently dispersed throughout who goes there in very very clipped ways you know, about the thing's abilities that uh, sort of come to light naturally in Frozen Hell. So as a, as a, for one perspective, I think the better presented story is Frozen Hell in a sense, 
but it is slower paced. It takes longer to get there. You know, if I was going to recommend one, I would probably just say, read who goes there, read the original one. And if you enjoy that story, then I would go ahead and read Frozen Hell and compare them. I think it's fun. It's not a significant investment for either one of them, honestly. I think the ebook for uh, who goes there is fairly inexpensive. I want to say five or six bucks. Frozen Hell isn't much more. Um, you can get a copy of Frozen Hell for not very much money. Um, who goes there is just a short story. You might actually be able to find that, although I can't say where, as in a short story collection somewhere and just read it like that. I don't know if it's ever been editorialized uh, since its original publication, if anything's ever been changed to it, but I have a feeling that it's been republished in other things. So you could always like, you know, buy it together with some other greatest science fiction story type collection. I'm sure that such a thing exists, but, uh, and there might, I know that uh, with the publication of this, it was discovered, by the way, and I, I kind of want to talk about a little all over, if I'm all over the place, I apologize, but if I, I really want to talk about just for a second, uh, the discovery of Frozen Hell. Um, Alec Navala Lee, I believe is the person who discovered this. Um, he writes the introduction, talks about this, which is actually very interesting. And that researching uh, Campbell's notes, he found, um, you know, remotely that there was a file in this Harvard uh, sort of like repo file repository or something that had the title Frozen Hell. And having gone through and read Campbell's letters back and forth with other, with other editors or writers, he discovered that that was the original title of the novella for that eventually became Who Goes There. And so he like hired someone to go investigate this file because he couldn't go all the way to, to Harvard University or the repository where they had this, these folders, these, uh, uh, these files. And had someone like scan this stuff and send it back. And he realized that he had the original manuscript, the original novella, and that's what he went on to publish. Uh, so it's a really kind of a cool, like, you know, slightly Lovecraftian sort of like uh, discovery that happened. I think that's kind of a, a really interesting, neat story. This thing that was basically lost was discovered in this like, you know, it's hidden away, kind of like the Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that, like stored away in some warehouse, you know, it was discovered, you know, almost 80 something years later. So I think that's pretty cool. So kudos to him to firing this and uh, kind of giving a really neat introduction. And then we get a great introduction as well by Robert Silverberg, a science fiction writer who I really enjoy. Who goes there begins with these scientists, you know, debating about whether or not to do with this thing. And there's, there's some differences, some important differences, not just in how the story paces out, but in the thing itself from the original story to the story, to the like screenplay that Ben Lancaster wrote and it eventually became the movie, The Thing. And one of them is that the thing in Who Goes There is psychic or has psychic abilities. And that's what is sort of like slowly reviewed, kind of like, well, I would say abruptly revealed or abruptly like jumped to that conclusion at one point in the middle of who goes there. And if somebody says, well, this thing probably has psychic abilities and is like, oh, you believe in those? Of course, it's proven by science. And then you just go right on and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Wait, you guys were really quick to accept that. Really quick based on what evidence. And then they kind of say, oh, well, this and this. And I had these nightmares and I knew this and this. And you're like, where did this come from? Oh, I knew this all along, you know, and it just, it just seems like, okay, kind of like a little bit of uh, like retconning almost. It almost feels a little bit like that. It's just like, where the hell did this come from? But that's an example of something being reworked from Frozen Hell because in Frozen Hell, when we get all this uh, additional material at the beginning, you have those characters having really bad feelings about this. And they're sort of like, like sort of really psych feel like slightly psychically attacked. Well, I don't think that those phrases are ever exactly used, but they have bad nightmares. And they later and they later attribute these nightmares to uh, the thing's ability. It doesn't really come into play very much, except for one scene where the thing is thawing, and a character is supposed to be doing some sort of cosmic ray studies late at night, and he's kind of watching the thing thaw out, and you know, he's kind of keeping an eye on it, make sure. I mean, I don't know, something doesn't happen to it. I don't know, the dogs don't get to it or something. I mean, I don't, know. not even that sure about that. So he's sort of watching it. The, he, he he like goes and looks at it. He even like notices while he's watching it. He goes and takes a look at it that it's like slightly moving a little bit, and it seems undisturbed. Which I was like, what? And he goes and sits down. I think, okay, whatever. And then he like hears sounds moving behind him, and he ignores them and keeps up with his work. And then the scene cuts away, and it's such a bizarre scene. It was like, what just happened? Why did he just sit there? What's Was he already like 
in is he already infected? Is he already I mean, what's happening? And it's only later that you find out in who goes there that the thing had like psychically like repressed him or something so that it, it could uh, attack him. Um, but the, that's led up to a lot more evenly in Frozen Hell. So I, I think that the pacing of Frozen Hell is better. But I still think that who goes there is a little tighter. And I think that it benefits from that. So I think in, in an ideal world, we'd get some sort of a in-between, like a, a, tight, a tightened up Frozen Hell, maybe still opening with that scene from who goes there and then sort of doing a flashback. I think that something like that could be really great. It's a real classic of science fiction, not just because it was remade in the 80s as a movie, but actually it had already been made in the, uh, I want to say in the 40s or the 50s, uh, by a, as a Howard Hawks movie called The Thing from Another World. And in fact, uh, uh, Carpenter <laughs> Carpenter saw that movie and was scared by it and that idea stayed with him and eventually he, that's, he went on and used that fear and the energy he had from seeing that original Howard Hawks movie to sort of inspire him to make 82's The Thing which I think is really interesting a note about the thing from another world is that it takes place in the Arctic and not the Antarctic and that the thing in that movie is like a plant creature and there's no taking over anything else's body or any of the body snatching type stuff. None of that stuff happens. Um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, and incidentally, I guess it, when I made a video about body snatching a while ago and the thing is probably a really great example of a body snatching type creature. I think it really fits the body snatching, um, motif. Uh, so I think it's something interesting to note i guess that it, that it sort of fits that uh that i just didn't want to talk about it at the time i guess i was saving it for this video and then here i am a long time later talking about it. so i don't know the thing is definitely a body snatcher if if we want to look at it then the criteria that i tried to set up in that video as far as like what and what is a body snatcher and what isn't it i don't know i had that thought in my head about what qualifies and what doesn't and i really thought it was interesting to me and i talked probably too long about it but it wasn't just that howard hawks movie that made the, that that recognized this story was interesting, and it wasn't just um, like that. Eventually, led to um, Carpenter making his '82 version of the thing, and then the, I think there's a newer version of the thing that's like a prequel that probably, in fact, probably follows more closely the original um, "Who Goes There" storyline. Although I will admit to you that I have not seen that more recent version of the thing. But in addition to all that, uh, the thing is featured in. Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, published in the late 70s. So before Carpenter even sort of revitalized this property, it was still recognized as a classic science fiction uh, alien, extraterrestrial. While we probably most, you know, most recognizably see that 82 version of the thing, it wasn't as though it had been completely forgotten. Now the mood of Who Goes There at Frozen Hell is is kind of um, like a mystery story, really. It really is more of a mystery, sort of like once the thing is loose and we don't see it anymore, right? It's the initial like attack happens. It is very similar to the movie, somewhat similar, similar to the movie uh, in 82 and also the Howard Hawks movie, very similar to the initial attack. And then the thing, does that thing is just killed, right? And then it's a silent predator. It's one of us. And that idea then is sort of like a murder mystery type thing. Like it's here and everybody starts getting very suspicious and very anxious. And people are looking at one another and nobody trusts anybody else. And I really love that energy. In addition to that, um, I think one of my favorite things from Who Goes There that I think is um, never expressed in the movie, how hyper, hyper dangerous and deadly its presence is. Not just because of what it can do in the moment, but because you can't really win against it. Or it's like almost impossible to win. When they make another logical leap and decide that this thing can change shapes, again, I think that that comes from some sort of psychic impression that they have. And that's how that leap was able to made be made so quickly, which seems a little off to me when I read it, but but I was like, okay, we're moving the story along. Fine, fine, fine. Wait, okay, we know what's going on. It can change shapes. Cool. If a bird, like I think an albatross is used as an example, were to land out here, you know, if it gets a little warmer and it were to come out here and land for some reason, if it attacks the albatross, and it could become an albatross. And if it could become an albatross 
and fly away, then it will kill everything. And because it's very also very clearly stated that like what they think the intent of this of the thing is, and it's to kill and dominate everything, to make every living thing on the planet itself. I, again, a, a bit of a logical leap to sort of assume that that's what it's going to do. I mean, I guess, but it, oh, but it also is trying to highlight the terror around this thing getting out. If they weren't in the Antarctic, surrounded by miles and miles and miles of ice and s extreme cold, where almost no living thing can exist, really no living thing can exist, basically, uh, although there might be, maybe there's some bacteria or something, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but, but in, the, in terms of the 38, nothing from 1938, nothing else can exist, or if it were able to get to the coast and get one fish, then that's it. It's over. Because that fish could go on to be eaten by an orca. Here we are going back to uh, <laughs> Peter Duncan's killer, right? That would have been, whew, something. <laughs> but then it could have become an orca. And that orca could then prey on anything. And they talk about how it doesn't matter um, if the thing in whatever new form it has is attacked or not. Then it can just become whatever the thing that attacks it. It can infect that thing and has the original and it can become both. And if it becomes a bird, it can start laying eggs and hatching more things and it's just sort of like oh shit <laughs> that's really frightening that it takes so very 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 little like almost nothing it's like one drop of blood one anything out of this environment the the, the only environment that could realistically contain it and it's over for everyone and that's so chilling so so pitch perfect and who goes there they're able to defeat it unlike the uncertainty from the 82 film and we could talk all about uh that and about who really is the thing and i think there's a whole bunch of uh really interesting commentary uh that i've seen more recently about like um how um kurt russell's character in the thing might actually be infected the whole time i thought that was a really interesting examination of that concept and it actually pretty convincingly laid out although not 100 percent convincingly but pretty damn convincingly laid out um but just the, the whole uncertainty around that right that is definitely heightened and i think it's one of the highlights of the 82 film is a double down on the sort of who is it who does go there who is the thing which one of us is it the thing acts much faster and has a much faster uh, ability to react in the movie than it does in the book and in the story i should say just a little slower definitely some interesting highlights the thing has different abilities maybe isn't quite as capable in some ways it feels much more like an alien and less like a monster and you know and i also kind of wonder you know we talked i, I talked we didn't i mean maybe you did uh about the uh, ship being made of magnesium and it kind of makes me think too like well if the thing itself you know was in this ship then are we certain that that is a ship from the that species? Is it something that they stole or took from them? And that's kind of a uh, a body snatching motif. That's something that is explored in um, Heinlein's uh, Puppet Masters. I understand Heinlein has problems. Trust me, I get it totally. But I really like that story. I like that story for it's uh, the sort of in the same way that you know here the thing is this dread about um it getting out it's the same a very similar sort of dread in that puppet master story so i really do recommend who goes there and again we will talk about the barlow's entry here in just a minute i'll show you the illustration that he's got for which is a little typically uh an unusual take from barlow which i which i always love there's one more thing i want to talk about in addition to who goes there and frozen hell which i do recommend that you go pick up uh there's another story that's the uh, novelization of the 82 movie. Now, I'm not normally somebody, in fact, I don't know that I've ever really truly read a novelization of a movie. I generally take a dim view of that kind of stuff. But because I was reading a couple different versions of the thing here, and I went and watched the original uh, Howard Hawks movie, and then watched the 82 movie. I know I didn't watch the most recent thing, but that's okay. So for that reason, I was interested in it. And my brother-in-law is a kind of a, he likes to collect those. Uh, he, he likes to collect novelizations, right? And he said that, um, or he thinks that they're interesting. And, and I guess, I not having read them, he said that there are a few of them that are pretty good. And he's always heard, he's always been very interested in reading Alan Dean Foster's novelization of The Thing. And I thought, 
Interesting. Alan Dean Foster. I know that he wrote a novelization for Alien, or is it Aliens? I can't remember. Um, that I actually intend to read, especially now. So uh, I kind of heard about, he told me about that and said he was interested. And I said, oh, I'll keep an eye out for if I ever see it. He said, oh, he probably won't. I said, oh, okay. Um, and he's right. You don't. You don't see it. It's uh, like out of print and it is a collector's item. It's a collecting type book, uh, which I thought was ugh, kind of unfortunate. I was able to secure a copy. I was able to find a UK copy for a what I thought was high, but not too painful. <laughs> not too painful. I think, oh, I want to say it was like 60 or something, which honestly, compared to some of the US covers, was pretty reasonable because I think those started like in like like not exactly rough but not really great condition at like 80 so that's what I'm saying this is a collector's book and you know so it's a little difficult for me to recommend but honestly it was really really great I really enjoyed it it isn't trying to do anything crazy with the narrative it, it follows the screenplay pretty closely not that I've read the screenplay but it follows the movie pretty closely there are some differences there's extra scenes in the story that aren't in the movie it reads like an 80s like a really good 80s movie it reads that way which is awesome in addition to that it really capitalizes on this sort of like I don't know like this sort of like whittling down of the population in this Antarctic camp it really capitalizes on it It definitely feels like this like like horror sci-fi murder mystery that the characters are like in this desperate struggle to figure out who it is. There's just a lot more time. Foster has a lot more time in that story, in that novelization, to work through that energy. And so you're constantly going, could it be this person? Could it be this person? Who is it? What about this guy? And it just worked so well. I honestly highly recommend it. If you like the thing, it really is a good read. It really is worth spending money on I whether you feel that it's worth spending that much I don't know I don't know I don't know I got that book you know because I wanted to give that to my brother-in-law it was a kind of a gift we, said, we don't have to explain the, the reason I want to give somebody a gift it's cool I wanted to give them a gift whatever I wanted to do something for somebody but I I don't know that I'm enough of a thing fan that I don't I think I would have hesitated I would have been like oh I don't know if it's worth it I'm gonna say that if you are a fan of the thing if you're a fan of the thing or John W. Campbell's story that I think Foster really kind of gives you a really great story that actually is rewarding. It does give you something that you didn't quite get from the movie. There's a few extra scenes in there. You get to spend more time with those characters. And I think that murder mystery aspect is really, you know, heightened and well done. So I don't know how many novelizations of movies I would really read, but I'm going to say I was not disappointed by this. In fact, I think that it was the superior story to the Who Goes There stories. I mean, I think it was superior. And I think it made for a better story. Now, certainly it has the benefit of all the stuff that Campbell had, all the hard work Campbell had done in coming up with the story. It had none of the uh, limitations that it, that uh, Campbell would have been limited to with his short space for a short story. And he went, you know, Foster had a novel. And of course he had Bill Lancaster who sort of rewrote and sort of restructured the story to pace out the sort of drama a little better. So he has the, the benefit of all those things. But, in a, but nevertheless, the way that he delivers the story is very satisfying, very enjoyable. So if you enjoy the movie, The Thing, if you enjoy Alan Dean Foster, I would recommend it. I, it's a difficult story to recommend to say that go spend, you know, 60, 70 bucks, maybe probably more on a uh, paperback novel. But uh, if you could find a copy, maybe you could find a beat up copy or something. I don't know. I, I really feel like it's unfortunate that it's out of print, especially when uh, his alien or aliens novelization is. So there's got to be some sort of copyright thing going on. I don't I have no idea. Uh, you know, if somebody knows, you could tell me. I mean, it'd be interesting to know why, but I imagine there's some tie up with the with the IP. I don't know. It seems like, you know, maybe they don't want to pay him or something, which is stupid. I know there was some issue with uh, Disney not wanting to pay Foster for his Star Wars novels or something, which I think is fucking ridiculous. I mean, but whatever. Uh, Foster is a classic science fiction writer. I've not read a lot of his stuff, um, but this really makes this story, the, his version of the thing, really makes me want to read more of his stuff. Makes me want to read his alien novelization. So, uh, that's something I'll probably end up doing uh, eventually. <laughs> I'm not going to commit myself to say, I'm gonna say soon. I'm going to say soon. No, I'm not going to say soon. It would be a mistake. I say soon too much. Anyhow, um, so 
those three are all worth it, all worth your time, all worth your time. If I, if, if you are on a budget, then you can just go straight to who goes there. It's the least expensive. You can get an e-version of it pretty cheap. I am certain that you could find an old collection of classic science fiction that has who goes there in it. I'm almost positive that would, that would be something you could do. I have not personally found one, but, or looked for one, but I'm certain, I'm certain that you could. That's not something you want to do. Then you can always go with Frozen Hell. That's as, I think maybe the thing, I don't know if, uh, I'm sorry, I think maybe who goes there might have a print version. I'm not certain about that. I'm not certain if that's true. There might be, um, I know with the with the publication of Frozen Hell that there was a collection of short stories where various writers wrote short stories in the same setting, like they kind of riffed on the idea of the thing, and it, which I think is really neat. I, I mean, maybe at some point I'll read that. They might have in one of those collections republished Who Goes There. I, um, if I find that out that it, that is true, then I'll uh, I guess I'll put some up on the screen. Frozen Hell is definitely great. I think that if um, if you don't mind a slightly longer narrative, that I think it is worth uh your time humorously i was going to buy this and i, I told my wife and she goes oh i think i have that i'm like what do you mean you have it goes, oh i backed the kickstarter i'm like you backed the kickstarter really she did yeah yeah this is a kickstarter version of the way i'm like you i'm not you're too good for me <laughs> anyways so we had it it was like sitting on the shelf over some over here the whole time and i'm like i didn't even know so we had it so i didn't have to buy it but but whatever um, and then Foster's novelization is really uh, just really pleasurable, really fun to read. Uh, it was really great to uh, to give that to my brother-in-law. And he was excited to read it. And I told him, you know, hey, I hope you don't mind, but I read it. Uh, and it really is worth your time. It really is good. I, I recommend it. So um, it was it was, a, it was a fun experience. And I, unfortunately, I would love to have that book here. I, I, I bought it thinking I'd do something and then I could, you know, and show you the book. Well, I don't. I can put up the cover, what it looked like. Um, but I don't have it. And I feel kind of weird about saying, oh, can I borrow that book to be in a... I was like, eh, it's, it's okay. It's fine. So if you're hoping to get a look at the book, I don't know why you're hoping that. I'm not going to have it here to show, but I did, you know, uh, I did at one point have that book. I probably took a picture of it and sent it to my sister. I'm like, don't let him buy this book. <laughs> if he's like looking for it right now and he sees it, don't let him buy it. Because <laughs> then I would be like, oh. So there's all that. Wait a minute. We got to do the Barlow stuff. Yes. Who Goes There is featured in here. And the Barlow's Guide, Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, features all the, uh, these published in the late 70s. And it seems like it should be in alphabetical order, and it is, because I need to remember the alphabet. Um, so here is uh, Barlow's illustration. Actually, kind of a good, chilling illustration. Who I will probably mess the screen up. It seems a little silly, but this is true to the original presentation of the thing in the story. The, the thing in Who Goes There is like very bizarre looking it does not it actually has a form this is supposed to be its face at least more close to what its true alien form is supposed to be at least i believe that that's what they decide based on psychic impressions <laughs> um and it's got a really good entry in here um and of course it does say that it was published originally as don stewart don a stewart about one and a half meters tall with rubbery blue flesh and tentacled hands uh as a pulpy head with three gleaming red eyes and thick writhing tentacles. The thing that it does not have an intelligence that resides in its brain, but instead in every cell of its body. And that's an important distinction with the thing is that each cell of its body almost is like its own entity. So that, and that's where it becomes frightening. And it also makes me wonder that if like competing versions of the thing because then it's like, well, who's your competitor in your environment? It isn't it's its own competitor? You would think it would maybe maybe that's why the, these creatures have not dominated the universe because they you know these disparate versions of itself bat, you know you know come into conflict. Each individual portion of the thing has its own drive and will, which is how they ultimately discover if someone's infected or not. That really amazing scene where McReady heats up to something as simple as a copper wire and dips it into someone's blood. And when the blood retracts, then they know that that person is the thing. Um, the horror aspects in Campbell's story are there, but certainly not as prevalent as they are in the movie. It's certainly not the uh, horrible writhing mass that's constantly terrifying everyone. It's more like a silent predator that's just trying to escape. It, it doesn't want to, you know, time is its friend and also just getting away 
is all it needs to to uh, to win. And it sort of knows this, but maybe doesn't quite play out, uh, doesn't quite necessarily have the best strategy, it seems. Hmm. Really a fun story. Um, I think that Foster's version really captures that sweet spot between science fiction and horror and mystery that this sort of... Uh, this Campbell story really sort of resides in this really great soft, like sweet spot in between all those things. Another wonderful Barlow's Guide entry. Uh, you know, you get that also that little picture. Oh, I didn't show it. That's a wonderful little um, picture of the thing's face encased in ice. So fun stuff. Uh, Barlow's illustrations, a little, uh, a little silly looking, but also horrifying looking, but uh, genuinely true to the presentation of the thing. In the Carpenter movie, we get more of a sense of it having like a plant-like. There's some scenes with the thing, it opens up plant-like. And I think that's sort of an homage to the Howard Hawks movie. That's all. I, uh, I've i been like super busy, so I apologize that this video, I've been sort of like lazy. Also, like, you know, I have to have the energy, like the mental, like not just like I'm tired, but like the mental like exuberance to come on and talk about something. I don't like to do it if I don't feel the energy, right? And uh, it wasn't exactly that, but it's also I've been super busy because I've been reading Musashi, right? I've been reading Musashi and it is absolutely wonderful. Like just such an amazingly great book. It's not a short book. And these pages are all are like one step away from being onion skin, like literally. And the print is small. It's about the same length as Shogun. Uh, it's set in a similar time as Shogun. In fact, it's set almost the exact same time in Japanese history. Um, it's a completely different take. And I think that, um, I mean, I'm just gonna say right now, I feel in every single instance that it is superior to Shogun. If you liked Shogun, you should go find a copy of Musashi right now. Right, whatever, stop whatever you're doing. I don't care if you're driving to work, just pull over the side of the road. Go buy a copy of Musashi. You will absolutely enjoy it. I had that video about samurai movies and said, you know, like how much I love samurai movies. And I've always kind of struggled to find, like kind of wondered if, I don't want to say I struggled to find, everybody looked. But I always wanted to read a book that was like a samurai movie. Well, this is it. Exceeded all my expectations. And in addition to that, uh, made me uh, made me realize I wanted things I didn't even know I wanted out of a book. Really great experience. I'm about halfway through. It's taken some time. It's definitely taken some time to get through this book. And I'm not, and I, you know, normally I would, uh, like in Shogun, I'd read it before so I could speed the reading up a little bit. I debated turning up the speed on this book to read it a little faster. And I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm enjoying, um, I wouldn't say languishing it, but just taking my time with it. So if you're wondering, oh, is there anything, you know, I'm kind of, I want something to read. It's good, good long book, like this book. Read this book. This book is, Musashi, is so good. Uh, really. So <laughs> nothing else to say. Thank you for your time. I'm supposed to, probably hours ago, I should have said something. So if you enjoyed some measure of my rambling, well, you could think about liking this video. And if you really enjoyed it and you may be slightly masochistic, you could subscribe to me because I, you will absolutely have to tolerate seeing things like this again if you do that, or at least it will come up in your feed. Um, thank you for surviving to this point, for uh, tolerating me. Really enjoy uh, Carpenter's interpretation of Campbell's story. Campbell's explore, exploring the different versions of this thing was a lot of fun. Really can't recommend enough that you go try them out. I think it's a lot of fun to explore older science, older science fiction and kind of like have a little tongue in cheek when you do it to know that even though it was presented seriously, that there's some things that are a bit silly and just kind of just sort of like enjoy that silly part, but still appreciate what's trying to happen. Campbell's writing is good, never really truly amazing, but I think it was good enough. And I think that his concept and ideas were really great. And you can totally feel how much time and research he put in to these stories, even if uh, to our modern sensibilities, you seems a little bit like, mm, that's not quite how that stuff works. Or is that how that, is this how this works? That's it. My name is Virgil and this is Literally Books. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.